Hello and welcome to the History of Africana Philosophy by Chike Jeffers and Peter Adamson, brought to you with the support of the King's College London Philosophy Department and the LMU in Munich, online at historyofphilosophy.net. Today's episode, Meeting the Gaze, Franz Fanon's Black Skin, White Masks. In the early 1950s, Francis Janson was a senior editor at the French publishing house Editions du Seuil. One day, he was given a manuscript to read entitled Essay on the Disalienation of the Black Man. He was impressed by the work and invited its author, a psychiatry student named Franz Fanon, to come visit his office so that they might discuss its publication. Janson had barely begun to express his admiration for the work before the testy Fanon wisecracked, not bad for a negre, huh? Note that throughout this episode, we will be leaving that word negre untranslated, given that it is somehow between Negro and the N-word in its connotations and offensiveness. Janson was taken aback and angered by this sarcastic comment, and he told Fanon to leave. As it turns out, this firm reaction earned Janson Fanon's respect, and the two worked together fruitfully from that point on. It was, in fact, Janson who came up with the idea of replacing the manuscript's original title with the shorter and snappier Black Skin, White Masks. This first of Fanon's books is now widely recognized as a classic work of Africana philosophy, one that explores questions of race and identity in a uniquely powerful and provocative manner. Those who know even just a little about Fanon are likely to be aware that it was not his only book to gain recognition as a classic. The Wretched of the Earth, published after his death from leukemia in 1961 at the young age of 36, is generally viewed as one of the most important philosophical reflections on colonialism and anti-colonial struggle ever written. By the time he wrote that book, Fanon was no longer a student in France, but a revolutionary working with the National Liberation Front, the party that won Algeria's independence through a long and violent war with France. Fanon's time in Algeria and the wretched of the earth will receive our attention in the next episode of the podcast. Here we will introduce the man who did so much and wrote such significant works in so little time with a focus on his first book, Black Skin, White Masks. Fanon was born in Fort-de-France, the capital of Martinique, on July 20th, 1925, so, as this episode is airing just a few days after July 20th, 2022, we might as well say happy 97th birthday to our subject. His family was middle class, and as we mentioned in episode 88, Fanon attended the island's most prestigious school, the Lycée Chaucher, during the time that Aimé César was a teacher there. Fanon later reflected on the significance of César's return from Paris to Martinique to teach high school in his essay, West Indians and Africans, one of a number of essays collected in a posthumously published volume called Toward the African Revolution. Writing in 1955, Fanon claimed that the history of the French Caribbean should be divided into periods, distinguishing the time before the Second World War from what came afterward. He then explained that the first of a series of events marking the start of a new period was in fact Césaire's return to Martinique. It used to be the case, according to Fanon, that no West Indian in the West Indies proclaimed himself to be a Negro, claimed to be a Negro. César disrupted this situation, having the respectable social role of a teacher at the lycée, but holding the position that it is fine and good to be a Negro. Fanon helps us better understand the intellectual context of his own thought by emphasizing the supremely transformative impact of the turn to Black consciousness and Black pride that César and his friends and collaborators in Paris created with the Nicotude movement. Some commentators, notably Ryland Rabaka, even argue that Fanon should be considered part of the Nicotude movement, even if only because of César's massive influence upon him. Yet the ending of West Indians and Africans reminds us that Fanon is most commonly, and we believe most insightfully, recognized as a major critic of Nicotude. Having summarized his account of a turn among West Indians, now accepting of their blackness instead of wishing to be seen as no different from white French people, Fanon concludes, It thus seems that the West Indian, after the great white error, is now living in the great black mirage. We will return soon enough to Fanon's critical stance on negritude. Coming back to his life, his rebellious nature displayed itself early as he surreptitiously escaped from Martinique at the age of 17, traveling by boat to the island of Dominica 
note that this is Dominica, not the Dominican Republic, and it was a British colony at this time, even though a history of French colonization made French Creole a common language there, as in Martinique. Chique's father hails from Dominica, so please excuse the quick geography lesson. Fanon went to, say it with us, Dominica, to join the Free French Forces, as Martinique was then under the rule of Vichy France, the regime that collaborated with the Nazis. In Dominica, Fanon attained some basic military training, but his time there was short, as Martinique was soon liberated. Fanon's military career would continue, though. He enlisted in a Martinican battalion and was brought to North Africa for the first time. It would not, of course, be the last. His experience during the war in North Africa, as well as in France, where he was injured in combat, taught him much about racial difference and colonialism. His letters to family reveal a disillusioned young man, no longer convinced his sacrifice on behalf of France was worth it. Upon returning to Martinique, Fanon finished his studies at the Lycée, specializing in philosophy. In 1946, he left for France, and he would never again return to live in Martinique. He went first to Paris, but then moved to Lyon, joking to his brother in a letter that there were too many negres in Paris. He took up medical studies, specializing eventually in psychiatry. He also began to write a lot, including creative work like some plays that were only recently rediscovered and published. The surrealistic poetic style of the plays clearly owes something to the influence of Césaire. Black Skin, White Masks, published in 1952, is the product of his thinking and experiences over the course of the late 1940s and the opening years of the 1950s. Among other things, it is a work of psychoanalysis, and Fanon, in fact, tried to submit his initial draft of it as his thesis for his psychiatric studies. It was swiftly rejected, as his biographer David Macy puts it, on the predictable grounds that it defied all known academic and scientific conventions. Fanon, therefore, worked on and completed a different thesis, focused on his work with a patient suffering from Friedrich's ataxia, a hereditary neurological disease. The thesis raises important questions about how mental illness does or does not depend on neurological causes. One commentator has argued that, in this respect, it provides a foundation for black skin, white masks. The thesis takes the position that, even when a mental illness has clearly its origin in neurological disorders, it generally develops in a socially determined relational space which in turn explains the form it takes. In keeping with this, we can see black skin, white masks as a study of how socially determined relations explain pathologies relating to race. The introduction to black skin, white masks begins with a quotation from someone who we by now clearly recognize as a constant point of reference for Fanon, namely Césaire. Fanon builds on and seeks further to develop Césaire's thinking, even as we will meet other instances where Fanon is trying to criticize and move beyond his influence. The quotation comes from Césaire's Discourse on Colonialism, and it reads, I am talking about millions of men whom they have knowingly instilled with fear and a complex of inferiority, whom they have infused with despair and trained to tremble, to kneel, and behave like flunkies. The epigraph, particularly with its talk of an inferiority complex, announces this psychological focus of Fanon's book, indeed the psychological aspect of his thought in general. Both black skin, white masks, and the wretched of the earth are the products of Fanon's dual training in psychiatry and philosophy. Don't expect to see any explosion today, it's too early or too late. These are Fanon's enigmatic words following the epigraph, a fine example of the evocative and sometimes quite challenging style he adopts throughout much of the text, though his statement of the book's purpose is clear enough, this essay will attempt to understand the black-white relationship. It's also clear that that understanding will be informed by psychology. Fanon speaks of the white person and the black person as locked into their whiteness and blackness, respectively, and he labels this a double narcissism. His use of this term occasions this clarification of his method. Only a psychoanalytic interpretation of the black problem can reveal the affective disorders responsible for this network of complexes which is not to say that the problem being dealt with is psychological at its roots. He also writes, The analysis we are undertaking is psychological. It remains nevertheless evident that, for us, the true disalienation of the black man implies a brutal awareness of the social and economic realities. He therefore refers to what he attempts to accomplish in the book as a kind of socio-diagnostics. In the final paragraph of the introduction, Fanon writes, as those of a West Indian, our observations and conclusions are valid only for the West Indies, 
at least regarding the black man on his home territory. A study needs to be made to explain the differences between West Indians and Africans. This is the point to which Fanon would return a few years later in his aforementioned essay, West Indians and Africans. Here in the introduction to black skin, white masks, though, it raises questions as to the scope and applicability of Fanon's claims. Fanon's book has been taken so often by so many to illuminate general problems of racial identity, especially as experienced by black people in majority white settings, whether in Europe, North America, or elsewhere. Does his circumscription of his account here in the introduction to the experiences of Martinicans and other people from the French Caribbean mean that we should hesitate to apply his work and its lessons to, say, African-American experiences in the United States? Fanon himself calls attention to the wider applicability of the book at various points, including in the first chapter, The Black Man and Language. Like Alexander Crummel's speech on the English language in Liberia, which we discussed back in episode 53, this chapter of Black Skin, White Masks explores the topic of language by reflecting on how certain languages can be viewed as powerful forms of cultural capital. The mastery of French by the French West Indian is the chapter's central theme, but Fanon highlights that the concern is generalizable, writing, all colonized people, in other words, people in whom an inferiority complex has taken root, whose local cultural originality has been committed to the grave, position themselves in relation to the civilizing language, i.e. the metropolitan culture. Chapter 4 of the book is also relevant here, as it is a critique of another book published a couple of years previously called The Psychology of Colonization by Octave Manoni. That book happens to take as its point of reference not the French Caribbean, but Madagascar. Yet again, following in the footsteps of Césaire, who criticized Manoni in his Discourse on Colonialism, Fanon exposes various ways in which Manoni can be seen as blaming the victim and lessening the responsibility of the French in describing the psychological dimensions of the colonial situation in Madagascar. What Manoni seeks to avoid admitting, in Fanon's view, is that it is the racist who creates the inferiorized. There is no reason to follow Manoni in positing pre-colonial roots for the psychological difficulties afflicting the Malagasy or any other colonized people. The source of the problem is the colonial, social, and economic structure. In between the first chapter on language and the fourth chapter's critique of Manoni, we find two chapters on one of the most prominent themes of Fanon's psychoanalytic account of racial relations, namely, the impact of racial difference on the experience of gender and sexuality. Chapter 2, The Woman of Color and the White Man, and Chapter 3, The Man of Color and the White Woman, both focus, as their titles suggest, on the psychological dynamics undergirding interracial relationships of romantic and sexual kinds. The Woman of Color and the White Man features a sharply critical engagement with Mayotte Capetia, a Martinican woman who gained fame and accolades with her 1948 novel, which was titled rather appropriately, I Am a Martinican Woman. Fanon quotes passages from this semi-autobiographical work, in which his main character expresses a strong preference for white men. He takes this to be paradigmatic of a neurotic obsession with gaining full entry into whiteness that afflicts black people, at least in the French Caribbean context. In his chapter on The Man of Color and the White Woman, Fanon foregrounds a novel by René Maran, who we first learned about in episode 86 of this series. While it was his debut novel, Batuala, that made Maran famous and, as we saw, inspired great interest on both sides of the Atlantic, just as the Harlem Renaissance was getting started, Fanon's concern is with his 1947 novel, A Man Like Any Other. The main character of that novel, who struggles with professing his love to a white woman, serves Fanon as another example of neurotic obsession with whiteness. Fanon's thoughts on the psychological complexities surrounding the sexual interaction of black men and white women do not end in that chapter, though. We have discussed so far the book's first four chapters, and will soon turn to its fifth, the lived experience of the black man, undoubtedly the most famous and influential part of black skin, white masks as a whole. Before we see why, though, let us continue the thread of interracial sexual relations into chapter six, the black man and psychopathology, which is in fact the longest chapter in the book by far. One of Fanon's main concerns in this chapter is the way that black men in particular are phobogenic, that is, they are objects that give rise to phobias. He associates fear of black men on the part of both white men and white women very closely with an imagined sexual power on the part of the black man, 
an imagined sexual power that is, of course, often associated with the supposed size of a very specific part. David Macy points out an interesting fact to consider when reading Fanon's thoughts on this topic. His method of composing black skin, white masks, apparently involved not writing or typing himself, but rather dictating the text to Marie-Joseph Dublé, better known as Josie, his girlfriend at the time that he was writing the book, whom he then married the same year that the book was published. As Macy leads us to realize, Fanon was speaking aloud to his white girlfriend when composing these provocative lines from the opening of The Man of Color and the White Woman. I want to be recognized not as black, but as white, but who better than the white woman to bring this about? By loving me, she proves to me that I am worthy of a white love. I am loved like a white man. I am a white man. There is one more chapter following the black man in psychopathology before the short, but as we will soon see, highly significant conclusion. Chapter 7 is called The Black Man and Recognition, and features discussion of two important European thinkers, the Austrian psychologist Alfred Adler and the German philosopher G.W.F. Hegel. Fanon uses Adler to think about how Martinicans position themselves in relation to each other through various sorts of comparisons, but he emphasizes the importance of social conditions in response to Adler's focus on the psychology of the individual. According to Fanon, it is French Caribbean society as a whole that is neurotic. Thus, as he puts it, if there is a flaw, it lies not in the soul of the individual, but in his environment. With respect to Hegel, Fanon embraces his thinking on how the reciprocity of mutual recognition by others is essential for recognizing and valuing oneself. As he understands the history of Black people in the French context, there has not been enough of a struggle on the part of Black people to force white recognition of their humanity. This is another interesting moment where scope becomes important for Fanon's argument, for he views Black people in the United States as having done much more fighting for recognition. He claims that, 12 million black voices have screamed against the curtain of the sky. And he actually quotes the phrase 12 million black voices in English because he is invoking Richard Wright's 1941 book of that title. This is not the only time Fanon invokes Wright in the book, nor for that matter do we only find Adler and Hegel here in the seventh chapter. Adler comes up a number of times elsewhere, along with various other pioneers of psychology and especially psychoanalysis, such as Sigmund Freud, Anna Freud, Carl Jung, and Jacques Lacan. Hegel recurs elsewhere as well, but he's not the European philosopher who most completely captures Fanon's attention. That would be none other than Jean-Paul Sartre, undoubtedly the most famous philosopher in France at the time. Almost a decade before Black Skin, White Masks, Sartre published his most famous philosophical work, Being and Nothingness. It is a work of existentialism, which is a term we get from Sartre himself, even if we also often use it for thinkers that precede him, like Søren Kierkegaard and Friedrich Nietzsche. We can define existentialism as a mode of philosophical thought that does not take for granted the meaning and value of human existence, but rather treats the individual's search for purpose in life as a central philosophical problem. Influenced by the German philosopher Martin Heidegger, Sartre pursued his existentialist thought by means of phenomenology a philosophical method that requires paying attention to our conscious experience of the world from a particular point of view in order to reach philosophical insights. If being and nothingness is a work of existential phenomenology, so is black skin, white masks, especially in virtue of its central fifth chapter. Note, however, that another work of Sartre's, published in 1946, is cited by Fanon a great deal more often than being and nothingness. The work is commonly known in translation as anti-Semite and Jew, but a more literal translation would be Reflections on the Jewish Question. This title indicates that it belongs to the long and controversial tradition of works on what to make of Jews and prejudice against them among Europeans, going back to works like Karl Marx's On the Jewish Question. Fanon certainly finds Sartre's study helpful. Sometimes he uses it to reinforce his claims about what black people experience. It's when he follows his assertion that it is the racist who makes the inferiorized with this quotation from anti-Semite and Jew, the Jew is one whom other men consider a Jew. That is the simple truth from which we must start. It is the anti-Semite who makes the Jew. At other times, he uses anti-Semite and Jew to provide points of contrast. In the fifth chapter, for example, he includes this quotation from Sartre's book, they, the Jews, have allowed themselves to be poisoned by the stereotype that others have of them, and they live in fear that their acts will correspond to this stereotype. 
we may say that their conduct is perpetually overdetermined from the inside. In response, Fanon reflects on the way that the Jewishness of the Jew can go unnoticed. He is not integrally what he is. As a European in appearance, the Jew is not immediately subject to the stereotypes that mark him as different and dangerous. By contrast, the black man cannot simply go unnoticed, as his physical appearance immediately announces his difference. Thus, unlike the Jew, Fanon claims that black people are overdetermined from the outside. The first translation of Black Skin, White Masks rendered the title of the fifth chapter rather inaccurately as the fact of blackness, thus masking Fanon's existential phenomenological approach. As we said, a truer rendering would be the lived experience of the black man. One of Fanon's most important interpreters, Louis Gordon, points out that at least two other important French philosophers of the time are being invoked through this title. Simone de Beauvoir's classic existentialist work of feminist philosophy, The Second Sex, which was published in 1949, is made up of two parts, and the second of these is entitled Lived Experience. So Fanon can be understood as building on his fellow existentialist Beauvoir by turning the focus from gender difference to racial difference. Even before Beauvoir used the term, though, it was apparently introduced as a way to translate the German term Erlebnis by Maurice Merleau-Ponty, whose status as a major philosophical voice in France was established by his books, The Structure of Behavior, from 1942, and especially Phenomenology of Perception, published in 1945. Merleau-Ponty's version of phenomenology involves a focus on how we experience, perceive, and know the world through our bodies, and consciousness of and through the body is a central theme of the lived experience of the black man. Early in the chapter, we find the book's most famous phrase, Look, a negre. It is generally presumed that Fanon is here relating an actual experience that he had in Lyon. He describes a white child excitedly gaining the attention of the child's mother and pointing at the negre, that is, at Fanon himself. He sums up the existential dilemma that arises out of this experience as follows. I came into this world anxious to uncover the meaning of things, my soul desirous to be at the origin of the world, and here I am, an object among other objects. With characteristically seminal phrasing, Fanon explains here how an encounter with racial designation can flatten the individuality of the black person, thus rendering an active subject into a simple object. We have seen Du Bois talk of double consciousness, but we find Fanon taking it up a notch by talking of being aware of my body no longer in the third person, but in triple. In this moment of awareness, he finds himself responsible not only for my body, but also for my race and my ancestors. In other words, he represents no longer just an individual, but rather a race understood as a kind of homogenized whole, as well as, looking backward in time, a mythical history of that race. Fanon writes, I cast an objective gaze over myself, discovered my blackness, my ethnic features, deafened by cannibalism, backwardness, fetishism, racial stigmas, slave traders, and above all, yes, above all, the grinning Ia bon banania. That final phrase, purposefully left in French in the more recent translation of Black Skin, White Mass, was translated in the first English edition of the book as show good eaten, a choice that allows readers to have some sense of the passage's meaning while well, raising once again the question of whether the situation of African Americans in the United States is interchangeable with that of French West Indians in France. Ia bon banania was the advertising slogan of Banania, a breakfast cereal, which used the image of a smiling Senegalese soldier in its ads. Show good eaten captures, at least to some extent, the fact that the phrase Ia bon banania, meaning banania is good, is expressed in a pidgin French stereotypically associated with Africans. If this is the existential dilemma, the problem of wanting to be recognized as human, but being deflated instead by the overbearing power of racial stereotypes, then what is the solution? This chapter, The Lived Experience of the Black Man, presents a series of failed attempts at finding a solution. There are arguably more than two attempts, but we will satisfy ourselves with identifying just two, the attempt at assimilation and the attempt at the reverse of assimilation, which we can specify as negritude. The white gaze, first exemplified with the child who said, look, a negre, to his mother, mercilessly breaks down both of these attempts at escaping the reduction to stereotypes. We've already mentioned one important step in Fanon's argument that the attempt to assimilate must fail, 
namely that the black person cannot go unnoticed, as the Jew can. Furthermore, Fanon argues that assimilation is no solution, because no matter how successful a black man may be, his position in a racist society is always a precarious one. He uses a black doctor as an example. I knew, for instance, that if the physician made one false move, it was over for him and for all those who came after him. What, in fact, could one expect from a negro physician? As long as everything was going smoothly, he was praised to the heavens, but watch out, there was no room whatsoever for any mistake. No matter the black person's success and achievement, the smallest failure exposes him as the inferior being he always was in racist white eyes. Assimilation is thus hopeless, a position Fanon memorably expresses this way, whereas I was prepared to forget, to forgive, and to love, my message was flung back at me like a slap in the face. The white world, the only decent one, was preventing me from participating. It demanded that a man behave like a man. It demanded of me that I behave like a black man, or at least like a negre. The failure of assimilation leads Fanon, or at least the character in whose voice he wrote the chapter, to turn to negritude. I finally made up my mind to shout my blackness. Fanon quotes at length from Senghor's essay, What the Black Man Contributes, and from Césaire's Notebook of a Return to My Native Land. For Fanon, a key aspect of negritude is the decision to cease fighting against the projection of stereotypes, choosing instead to embrace them and revalue the characteristics painted by the racist as negative. He writes, I had rationalized the world, and the world had rejected me in the name of color prejudice. Since there was no way we could agree on the basis of reason, I resorted to irrationality. It was up to the white man to be more irrational than I. Think here of Senghor's infamous claim that emotion is Negro as reason is Greek, or Césaire's poetic celebration of those who have invented neither gunpowder nor compass. As it turns out, though, the path of negritude leads to failure, just like the path of assimilation. Fanon's critique is both fascinating and difficult fully to understand. He depicts a variety of retorts to the negritude stance from a white perspective. Firstly, it is unoriginal, as Europe too has had its own back-to-nature mystics. Secondly, an industrialized society dominated by science must necessarily privilege rationality over sensitivity, which leaves the rational white man in charge, while the emotional black man can at best represent the childhood of the world. But the final straw breaking the back of negritude comes, ironically enough, from the very piece of writing that helped to make negritude something of a household word in France, Sartre's Black Orpheus, his preface to Senghor's anthology of negritude poetry that we first introduced in episode 87. Fanon reports that when he read this preface, he told his friends, the generation of young black poets has just been dealt a fatal blow. How so? Fanon quotes Black Orpheus at some length, but we can pick out two particularly relevant portions of what Sartre says. First, the negre, as we have said, creates an anti-racist racism. He does not at all wish to dominate the world. He wishes the abolition of racial privileges wherever they are found. He affirms his solidarity with the oppressed of all callers. Then later, in fact, negritude appears as the weak stage of a dialectical progression. The theoretical and practical affirmation of white supremacy is the thesis, the position of negritude as antithetical value is the moment of negativity. But this negative moment is not sufficient in itself, and the blacks who employ it well know it. They know that it serves to pave the way for the synthesis or the realization of the human society without race. Thus negritude is dedicated to its own destruction. It is transition and not result, a means and not the ultimate goal. Sartre's proclamation that negritude is dedicated to its own destruction certainly does sound like a condemnation to death, which could explain why Fanon thinks Sartre dealt the movement a fatal blow. But this raises the question, is Fanon criticizing Sartre here? The tone of catastrophe suggests as much, but if he is criticizing Sartre, then why accept that negritude must die? Just because Sartre said so? Tellingly, Fanon says of Sartre, what is certain is that at the very moment when I endeavored to grasp my being, Sartre, who remains the other, by naming me, shattered my last illusion. There's no doubt that Fanon is describing his reaction to Sartre's words as a painful one, but by saying that what Sartre shattered was an illusion, he is evidently calling negritude itself illusory. Perhaps then we should see Fanon not as criticizing Sartre, but as crediting him with revealing a truth. Negritude cannot provide the securely autonomous black identity it seemed to promise. It is a reactive response to the privileging of whiteness. 
And precisely by being reactive rather than active, it proves itself dependent on whiteness. Thus, negritude must be left behind. Like assimilation, it leaves one tangled in the webs of a white racist society. But as we've admitted, this is a difficult argument to interpret, and most scholars find ways to claim that Fanon really is criticizing Sartre for something. The variety in these interpretations can be surprising. Robert Banasconi reads Fanon as offering the response of an existentialist to a Hegelian or dialectical account, claiming that Fanon is in this way more Sartrean than Sartre. By contrast, Gavin Arnall argues that Fanon faults Sartre not for being too Hegelian, but for being not Hegelian enough. Without deciding who was more Huian than whom, we would point out that however one chooses to characterize Fanon's apparent critique of Sartre, it must surely be read in the light of the far more blatant rejection of negritude in the book's conclusion. Here, Fanon states, It is not the black world that governs my behavior. My black skin is not a repository for specific values. To view blackness as associated with specific values, as negritude would have us do, leads the black person to deny what is at the heart of Sartre and Fanon's existentialism, the radical freedom of the individual. Sartre famously argued that, in the case of the human being, existence precedes essence. We are not like tools whose essence and function are the reason they are brought into existence by the toolmaker. Rather, we exist, and then we seek meaning. This means that we are free to define our own purpose. In accordance with this, Fanon rejects the idea of preset values derived from racial identity and imposed upon individuals. In its place, he defends a commitment to defend not only one's own freedom, but the freedom of all others. He writes in express opposition to the ideal of racial solidarity, Every time a man has said no to an attempt to enslave his fellow man, I have felt a sense of solidarity with his act. There is something powerful going on here, but let us be honest about just how far Fanon goes in rejecting the ideals of black consciousness, pride, and solidarity. Radical freedom means not being chained to the past. Fanon takes this to mean, among other things, that I have not the right nor the duty to demand reparations for my subjugated ancestors. And it's not just that black people can't demand reparations. He tells us that ultimately, black people cannot be black. He writes, Here is my freedom, which sends me back to my own reflection. No, I have not the right to be black. To choose to be black, Fanon tells us here, is to choose to be unfree. So is the choice of the white man to be white. What we cannot do is avoid choosing entirely. So why not choose freedom? We saw that chapter 5 ended in frustration with the path of assimilation and the path of negritude both reaching a dead end. Does this existentialist conclusion to the work fare any better? Well, consider this elaboration on his rejection of any kind of devotion to a racially identified culture. It is not because the Indo-Chinese discovered a culture of their own that they revolted. Quite simply, this was because it became impossible for them to breathe in more than one sense of the word. The Fanon we find in this phrase is the one celebrated as a revolutionary. And it is worth noting that this passage seems to have inspired some signs seen during the Black Lives Matter protests of the previous decade, given the similarity to I Can't Breathe, the chant memorializing Eric Garner, a victim of police brutality. In coming episodes on the Black Power movement and especially the Black Panthers, we'll be reminded that African American thinkers have been responding to the horror of police brutality for a long time and drawing on Fanon as they did so. But in the next episode of this series, we will learn more about Fanon's own views on violence, what it does to its victims, and why violent revolt may finally provide a way out of the psychological problems associated with racial difference. That's a dramatic note to end on, but we'll have to leave you in suspense for a while, as this is the last episode of the Africana series before the summer break. We'll return in early September, when our look at Fanon's other masterpiece, The Wretched of the Earth, resumes our coverage of the history of Africana philosophy. <music>